silence, why this jubilee? Why your joyous strains prolong? What the gladsome tidings be, which inspire your heavenly song? just thank you for your presence here this this advent season we ask that as we uh we are here during this service as we hear the message as we sing together lord that you open our hearts to this season open our hearts to the true meaning of christmas open our hearts to your love um, allow us to soak it in so that we can take it out into the world this season and and show people what uh what christmas really is god we just we just thank you for that it's in your name that we pray amen you may be seated for uh, the lighting of the Advent candle. Come on up, guys and gals. This is a time especially for you. All right, come on. Good deal. Well, I am glad that you guys are here. Oh, 
And let's step on over to our Advent wreath, because this is a time for us to light that candle. And let's see, we've got a lot of boys. Hmm. Well, we'll see how we can do this. Move that up. Okay, you're going to hold that for me? Well, come on over here. Every year we do the same thing. It's part of our tradition. This is called our Advent wreath because this is the first Sunday of the new Christian year. This is actually the day that, that even though January says 2014 begins, the Christian year begins today. And we have four Sundays until we come to Christmas. And, and we have different things, and we're going to tell you what those are. Prophecy, preparation, joy, and peace. And so today is our, our day of prophecy. Now, this is a big word is prophecy, and I know some of you have been up here before. You might remember it. What is a prophecy? What happens in a prophecy? Anybody know? Do you remember Jackson? No. Do you remember Braden? No. Cameron, do you remember? Christopher, do you remember what happens in a, in a prophecy? Yeah, kind of like that. Only it's not a prediction. Of, of the difference between uh, a soothsayer might tell you the future, but a prophet sees the future as if it's already happened. It's like God opens up a window in time and space, and they can see events that, that are not yet taking place, but it's almost as if they were already going on. And so today we have that, the prophecy candle that we're going to light because long before Jesus was born, Long before he came to earth, um, Isaiah saw his coming and told us what his kingdom would be like. But the prophecy isn't about Jesus coming as a baby. The prophecy is about him coming as our king. And that's what we look forward to. So we have to light the candle of prophecy. And Jacob, I guess you're holding that, so we'll let you light the candle of, of prophecy. And now remind me, girls that a girl lights the candle next week, okay? Right here. Can you get that? I think you've got it. Perfect. Now it's burning. So the candle of prophecy. Prof preparation, joy, peace, and then the Christ candle. So I'll ask you next week, see if you guys remember. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for prophecy. Thank you for showing us, not as if it's the, somebody can predict it, but because you already know what's going to happen. You can show it to us, and we know that it's true. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining me. You can join your moms and dads, your grandpas and grandmas, your friends and your relations. We're going to ask you to join us in the Advent candle song. And as this is something that we're going to be doing um, each week through Advent, we're going to actually sing it through twice, once for you to get a chance to become familiar with it, and then once for you to join with us.
It's now time for our joys and concerns. As we come together and share our joys and concerns, just a couple that I'd like to lift before us as, as a concern. Uh, Scott Pearson's father, Eldon, who's part of the Salem Church, died this morning, and we want to keep Scott, of course, and his family in our prayers. Also, as I've shared, Cal's funeral is tomorrow at 1030, and we want to keep Winston in our prayers as, as they get ready for, for that funeral. And the other that I wanted to bring up for our attention, of course, is to continue to remember the Ron family as, as um, Deidre's funeral was this last week as well. We just had a lot of families touched by, by tough events this week. Also, you'll see Sherry Sargent is the first name on our list. She um, had surgery this week. It was actually moved up to the beginning of the week and then had to go in for a second surgery. So she has been... Um, really struggling through this week. So please keep Sherry in your prayers. Any others that you have as joys or concerns that you'd like to lift before the congregation? Yes, Nancy. Okay, so friends, family, and an adopted son. Boy, you guys are going to go broke. <laughs> Speaking of going broke, <laughs> we said yes to the dress yesterday for Kate for her wedding. So oh, was... congratulations. <laughs> that deserves a hand. Yes to the dress. <laughs> Did they set a date? They have not. Oh, they haven't. Oh, wonderful. 2014. That's as far as we've gotten. <laughs> yeah, well, you've got a couple weddings coming up then. That's wonderful. Oh, I don't even want to think about that. No. Take your time, man. No. <laughs> yes. Wow. Sure, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And you know that Joe has been, this has been a long struggle. I mean, all the way back to July, right? It was so. Yeah, it was two months before that, that started. Right over over a half a year. So we want to continue to keep Joe in our prayers. And, and you'll keep us informed as we grow closer to the third as to time, things like that. Anyone else? Yeah. Rehoko? Did you say he has an infection? Okay. What is his first name? Jacob. Jacob, who's a 10-year-old who's been fighting cancer, now has an infection. We'll be praying for him. Mike? Um, I don't know the exact date, but I know that this month my great uncle Tom is going to have both of his knees replaced. Um, so he's with two allergies of down to his leg and stay down the center, obviously. They're up in Jamestown. Okay. Sure, we will keep your Uncle Tom in our prayers. He gets that done. Anyone else? If not, then as we come before the Lord, let's take a few moments for our own personal prayer, followed by the pastoral prayer and the Lord's Prayer together. Let us pray.
Oh, Lord God, as we come to you, we know that you meet us wherever your people gather. You promise that where two or three gather, you are in their midst. And so we know that you, by your spirit, are present here. You've heard these concerns, and they're not news to you. But God, as we begin this new Christian year, as we start with anticipation, looking to your coming, Lord God, make us ready. Prepare our hearts. Forgive our sins. And help us see you as you are. Lord, we bring these needs before you. We know the need for comfort for Scott and the death of his dad, for Winston and the death of Cal, for the whole Ron family and Deidre's death. We just ask that you be there to bind up broken hearts, to heal those, those, those sorrowful moments. Be with Sherry as she recovers from surgery and Joe as he anticipates this court date. Lord, be with this Jake, little Jacob, this 10-year-old who's battling an infection from chemo. Lord, we bring before you Mike's uncle, Tom. We pray that all will go well as he prepares for his knee surgery. Lord, there are so many that are on our list for Ruth and Michelle, for Jerry, for Todd, for Melissa and Nancy, for Lori and Dick and Deborah, for Tyler and Cheryl and Sharon and Sumner. We ask that you touch each of these that have health concerns. We rejoice in in birthdays for, for friends, for family, for adopted sons, all in a week. We pray, O oh Lord, that all the birthdays that are to come will be blessed. Lord, thank you for teaching us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will our ushers come forward to receive God's tithe and our offerings? And will our confirmants help out on the sides? Another silent night Above your deep and dreamless sleep A giant star lights up the sky And while you're lying in the dark The shines an everlasting light Well, you were 
States of America looks like another silent night. As we're sung to sleep by philosophies that save the trees and kill the children. Lord God, giver of all good gifts, come and receive these gifts that we bring to you. But Lord, receive us too. For Lord, we want to be your witness here in this place to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scriptures for today are taken this, uh, through this Advent season. We're going to look both at Isaiah and then the Matthew passages these are traditionally part of our Advent season, but I want us to just add a little bit more for it's very easy for us to stop each of these passages when things are going well and miss the point. Isaiah, though written probably 500 years before Matthew ever lived or a little farther, really speaks to what is yet to come, as does Jesus in what he shares in Matthew. Reading from Isaiah chapter 2, this is the word of God. This is what Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised high above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between the nations, and he will settle disputes of many people. And they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. A nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. You have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob. They are full of superstitions from the east. They practice divination like the Philistines. They clasp hands with pagans. Their land is full of silver and gold. There is no end to their treasures. Their land is full of horses. And there is no end to the chariots. The land is full of idols. And they bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. Oh, so man... 
will be brought low and mankind humbled. And do not forget them. Go into the rocks, hide in the ground for the dread of the Lord, for the splendor of his majesty. The eyes of the arrogant man will be humbled, the pride of men brought low. The Lord will be exalted in that day. And then when asked what that day will be like, when will that day come? Jesus answers his disciples as as we see from Matthew chapter 24. This is the word of God. Jesus has been uh, proclaimed the king in Jerusalem. They've greeted him and now they're leaving the temple courts, going out, and somebody says, look how magnificent this building is. And Jesus says, really? Look at it. In a little while, not one stone will be left on another. And Jesus prophesies the overthrow of Jerusalem by the Romans, and then he moves on to what is yet to come with us. He says, no one knows about that day or that hour, or even, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered the ark. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. That is how it will be on the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the handmill, one will be taken and one will be left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So I say, you also must be ready, because you do not know when the Son of Man will come, or the hour when you are to expect him. Who then is the faithful, wise servant? whom the master has put in charge of his servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour that he is not aware of, and he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Lord God, we come to you and it humbles us. We come as we prepare for for your return. It's so easy for us to want to keep you as a baby in a manger, but you are a king. You are the conquering king. You're the one that brings peace to the earth or a sword. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm kind of caught today. This is one of those times where, where you get prepared and, you know, you should think ahead a little bit more, but I'm afraid that I'm going to have to just make an apology. Uh, we have guests with us, the Powells, who are from my home church, and I'm afraid that I use the same basic illustration the last time that they were here you're going to think I only have one sermon (laughs) and I do really I do you already know that I have one sermon the sermon is this is that Jesus Christ has come to this earth he has died for our sins he is raised for our glory and he calls us to make disciples of all the earth that there's not a single person any place in all the world that is outside of his love his care and his forgiveness and the only way that they're going to know it is if those that know him share that with them I guess we could go home now (laughs) because that is pretty much every sermon isn't it is there any other truth But I was thinking about this passage. I was thinking about the change in my family's life. As you know, my father is in the nursing home in Bowman, and that's a good place for him because he's content. He loves when people come and see him, but that whole concept of, of this not being home isn't really a part of his thinking. And so there's that sense of contentment when my sisters or, or I or somebody else visits and says, I've got to go now, Dad. He says, where? He says, well, I have to go home. He says, well, then where am I? Where am I? 
And I was thinking about that contentment and all the changes that that will bring about now in my family's life. The one that I was thinking of the most is my mom. You know, that is going to be that big change because really all of her life since she, uh, well, since she married probably has really been uh, revolved around my father. You know, what we did as a family, the hay that we bailed in the summer, our life being, you know, the family of a, of a football coach or track coach, you know, whatever my father's activities were, that is what dominated our life. And even to these end days of my father's life when he was at home, he pretty much got to sleep when he wanted to sleep, get up when he wanted to get up, eat when he wanted to eat, do what he wanted to do. And the one thing that he really liked to do every day was to take a ride. And so consequently, every day, as long as he was able to walk, they would go out, my mom and dad, on some ride around Bowman County, around Bowman, the best spot on earth. Now here's what I was thinking of, is that if you ride with my sisters, Cheryl or Susan or Amy, you tend to go west. You'd leave Bowman and you'd go the 13 miles and get to Rame, North Dakota, the highest city in North Dakota. All 160 people that live there can tell you. You can pick out the house that's on top of Rame, you know, and they know who actually lives in the tallest or the highest point in North Dakota in town. There may be somebody out of town that's higher, but in town. But every time that I'm home and I'm with my sisters, we go west into the country that's more ranch country, more rough, more rugged, more like the Badlands, that beautiful cowboy-type country that is uh, what I like too. You know, it would probably be the place that I would pick. Now, I would probably take you south of Bowman, down into South Dakota, down into the Cave Hills, because a lot of the bailing that I did was down along that road. But my mom, when she drives, she takes you 13 miles east, and then turns north of a little town called Scranton. And she goes up that Scranton Road to go by the Powell Plain. And there, through the year, she watches the crops. And that's what she loves to do. And I like to do it too. Now, my dad, when he was able to think and and reason and, and plan, he would go by hay fields. He liked to know how the hay was growing because that's what we would bail. But my mom grew up in a grain dealer's household. My mom grew up with a father that, that managed one of the family elevators up in Gladstone, North Dakota. And though she doesn't talk about having a lot of time with her dad, whenever she talks about being with her dad, they were doing one of two things. They were going to a rodeo on Sundays, or if you were really lucky, When you were little, you get to go in the car with your dad and you drive around and look at the crop. Every day that my mom would email, every day that I talked to her on the phone, I had the report, the crop report from Bowman County, Slope County, North Dakota. I knew what the Powells were doing. I knew where the Hiltons were harvesting. I knew what everybody was doing. I knew where the crops looked good. I knew where the crops looked bad. I knew who had too much rain. I knew who had too little rain. I thought about that, and I thought, what a change. Will my mom, now that my dad is in the nursing home, when spring comes, will she still take the trip around the country? Will I still get the crop report? I hope so. I hope so. For though I may like cowboy country, ranch land and hay fields, I certainly have grown accustomed to knowing what's happening at the Powell Place or Hilton's or any of the others that, that, that are on her list to report to me. And that's what Jesus tells us. He says there are going to be a lot of things that are going to be seem the same year in and year out, day in, day out. Things are going to look as if nothing ever changes, that people marry and give in marriage, that the world will just keep going on the same way that it always has, that spring will follow into summer, summer into fall and fall. 
winter. And you can expect that all the time, but Jesus tells us this, that that is not the case. There's going to be a day of reckoning. There's going to be a day when everything comes to an end. And it will be that great and glorious day of God. And on that great and glorious day of God, the harvest is brought in, that people will come and stream to God. As Isaiah sees it, the mountain of God, the hill of God, the temple being lifted up higher than any other hill or temple or building all around. And the nations will stream in and want to know what God has to say. And that the very presence of God will bring them peace. That the world that God has prepared for those that love him, those that seek him, as a world where swords become, become um, plowshares and spears become pruning hooks. It's a place where God settles the dispute and people live with no more war. A beautiful picture. A wonderful place. If I were to take it to Bowman, North Dakota, I would say that the grain bins are always filled that that unexpected third cutting of alfalfa hay is always to be expected. The calves are glossy and heavy, that the sheep are woolly and white. But then there's the other side. Isaiah says, but you forgot your people. Or more accurately, your people have forgotten you. For look at how they are. They run after, after their horoscopes. They look for divination. They want to know the future. They like magic. They think that they're secure if they've got a lot of possessions. And certainly their military industrial complex is a thing in which they put their trust. That should be on their coin. Not God. It sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? that all of those things that draw us away from God are there, and they can give us a lot of good things. There is nothing wrong with being rich. There is nothing wrong with being secure in your country. There is nothing wrong, I suppose, with any of those things. But if any of those things take the place of God, we have gotten off base and we will tremble because war leads to war. Wealth just leads to accumulation to the point that I just absolutely were, was flabbergasted this year, maybe because I'm getting older and I'm, and I'm not as willing because maybe I have everything that I need and I don't really need to add a whole lot more to my life, but I was just really for some reason bothered this year when the push was, and I understand it, you know, I understand our economics. We are not a nation that builds their economic base on saving. We built it on spending. Ending. But when you have to leave a table of thanksgiving so that you can run out early and get the best deal, there is something wrong with our world. That we leave people that we love and make people leave people that they love so that we can go and think that we're getting the good deal and the only person that has to act like they're happy doing it is that poor person that's ringing us up. Maybe you are one of those people. Maybe you are one of those folks that had to give up your Thanksgiving so other people could shop. Now, I don't want to get too much on that, but notice how the world has not changed. As good as it is to have things in abundance, it will not give us peace. And certainly by being strong in every way may deter evil for a while, but it will not bring us peace. Peace comes from the Lord. For those that truly turn to him and expect that God is going to be the one that can settle every dispute in their life, will find peace. When I was a little boy, really little, I can't even remember how old I was, so little that we still lived in our trailer house, so I must have been under 
the age of four, probably more like three or two. Now, my dad had an interesting way of raising kids. He was kind of like the hands-off method. You know, it was like, well, see how that turns out for you type thing. And in our trailer court, there were some really big boys. I don't know, they might have been five, six. You know, they were, they were really big and they were kind of mean. You know, and, and I can remember that, that they would come and, I, you know, I couldn't leave my yard. I had to stay in my yard, so I was pretty little. And they would come and they would tease me and taunt me a little bit. And finally, you know, one day I had enough. As they were teasing and taunting me, I just kind of nonchalant me in my three-year-old way, got up, picked up a stick that was right beside me. And I grabbed that stick, and I'm going to tell you without any pride, I had learned some words from my dad and I used them appropriately in that moment as I grabbed my stick and I chased those five-year-olds out of my yard. And that night, as my mom had told my dad what had happened and the words that I had said, and I was sitting on my dad's lap, and he told me that, that you know, maybe I shouldn't say those words. and Maybe trying to hit people with a stick wouldn't be the best deal in the world. He said, you know, I'll always take care of you. And I can remember I said, but dad, would you fight him for me? Now, I don't know the answer, but it must have been the right answer. Because, you know, I don't remember those boys after that time. I don't remember the words as well as I should either. But it brought me peace. When we turn to God, God gives us peace. Not only does he give us peace, but he gives us a place to go to find that peace. For we don't have to go to some mountain in Israel. We don't have to go to, to the Dome of the Rock on the, on the Temple Mount in old Jerusalem. We can come to the God who saves us. The one that will always be there for us. The one that makes sure that things are right because he is the temple of God. He is the sacrifice of God. He is the one that makes all things right. And that is what we hope for. And that's what we trust in. That even when our hearts break, even when the world seems unfair, that that God is going to step in, that Jesus is going to return, and he is going to make all things right. And that he is going to gather his children, and we will have our place in his kingdom forever. And though the world may not know it, or even begin to understand it, we do. Because this is for us. And that all he asks of us is to be ready. To know that sometime, somewhere, some way, he is going to come for us. No, I don't know. I don't know that day. I don't know that hour. Jesus says angels don't know it. Even the Son of God doesn't know it. Only the Father knows it. But we know that it will come. We know that when that day comes, that, that all things are brought to an end. But we also know this, that for those that do not know, it is not a great and a glorious day. It is not a day where you jump up and down with, with joy and anticipation. It is a day like the day that the flood came upon the earth. But for those that know, it is a day of glory. But what do we do? What do we do in the meantime? How do we get ready? How do we stay vigilant? Well, Jesus shows us something pretty important. Notice he doesn't give a long list of things that we have to do. He just simply says, be about the task, caring for the people that I've given you to care for. 
He says it in such a simple way. He says, how wonderful it would be for that servant that's doing what God asked them to do, what the master said, taking care of the people that are in his, in his sphere of influence, looking after it and making sure that they know what's going on. Now, I know it's true that in our lives that people would rather see a sermon than hear one any day. Me too. But they have to see it and hear it from us. For here is the thing, is that when that day comes, when time comes to an end, when one is taken and one is left behind, there is not a second chance. And that may be at the end of time, but that may be in every single person's life. That all of us, if it does not happen, if we are not alive when Jesus comes, we will certainly meet him when our life goes from that moment when we are one moment here on earth and the next moment in eternity. There is no gap of time between those two events. It is that present. It is that now. So what do we do? Think about those that are around you. Those of you that have children, those of you that have grandchildren, I want to talk to you first. Do they know of your faith? Do they know what Jesus Christ has done in your life? Have you shared that in words? And if you've shared it in words, would it make sense in the way that you've lived your life? How about the people around us that we work with, that we live with, that we go to school with? Do they know that we're different? Can we give a witness for the hope that dwells within us? Do they understand how important they are to God and to us? So important that we do not want them to inadvertently miss the boat. that they may know that this Savior who loves us, who beat our sword into a plowshare, our spear into a pruning hook, will do the same for them as well. Do they know? Do we take advantage of the opportunity to make that witness in our word and our deeds? Have you taken something off the tree that covered with our needs for living nativity. We have no other event quite so big where so many people are so open to the good news of Jesus Christ than to see a bunch of us standing out there dressed like kings or shepherds or angels or Mary to walk through our door and to drink that cocoa or cider, to eat that cookie, to have that opportunity of knowing that this is a place that wants them to see with their eyes and experience with their senses the reality that Jesus has come to earth. To those that we love know, to those around us, Are they willing? Are we willing? This is why we're given the prophecy. For the events would take place whether we knew them or not. Certainly that's what Jesus says. That those that do not know will act as if nothing has changed. That they'll marry and give in marriage. They'll eat, they'll drink, they'll live their lives. Seeking for meaning, seeking for fulfillment. And the day will come. But those that know, do we share? Jesus says how wonderful it is for that servant who is anticipating the coming of God, who, being in charge of few things, becomes master of much. And so as we begin this Christmas season, as we start our walk to that beautiful night when we light our candles and sing holy night, our silent night, and joy to the world, 
let's be sure that it is a wonderful, joyous night, not just for us, but all around us. Lord God, we anticipate. We want to give a full report. Lord, you've given us fields of friends, of family to watch. Lord, help us to bring in that harvest, to be aware. For this is your call upon your people's life. We don't know when you'll come. We don't know how you'll come. But we know that when you come, we'll know you, see you, be called by you. May you find us faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join me in our concluding song. place. May our Lord find us faithful. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this week's sermon from Southern Hills United Methodist Church. To learn more about Southern Hills, please visit us on our website at www.
www.sohillsumc.org. That's www.sohillsumc.org. Have a great week.